There you go. So uh, we have now recording enabled. And um, the other thing that I wanted to share with you before we start the webinar is about the principles of participation. Um, there have been a little bit of uh, engagement in relation to them uh, in the forum. So I just want to point out that those are uh, our uh, uh, terms of engagement, the way we want uh, these spaces to be uh, uh, to be take, in order to take care of each other. Uh, so please uh, take your time to go through them. They are in, at the at the beginning of the of the forum thread, uh, and also feel free to use them in any space that you um, uh, that that you hold to, uh, and uh, give us feedback both in this case and in any other case that you you use them. So uh, with uh, uh, so now let me introduce you to uh, the topic of conversation for this uh, for this webinar. Um, we will ha we have the pleasure to have with us three uh, women that have been deeply involved in the implementation of uh, mobile uh, telephony community networks um, in different parts of the world. Um, and uh, the person that will be uh, moderating or uh, facilitating the conversation, to be more precise, is Esther Young. Uh, uh, Esther is a student, sorry, graduate student uh, at the University of Washington. And she has uh, been uh, working on mobile telephony and community networks for quite some time, a few years already, uh, working both in the software side and getting the stack, the, the software working properly for communities to be able to use it, and the contributing in implementations uh, in uh, Philippines and Mexico, as I recall, and also now in uh, their own hometown in Seattle, uh, uh, Washington State in the United States. Um, we will also have uh, Lilian Chamorro and Penelope. Uh, Penelope and Lilian uh, right now are collaborating in, in TIC in some sort of capacity, but uh, Lilian comes from Colombia and uh, she is part of the uh, organization called Nodo. They have implemented uh, a, a 2G network in uh, in a region in Colombia, uh, and Penelope is part of uh, um, TIC, the Mexican organization that uh, runs multiple uh, networks in Mexico. Without further ado, let me give the microphone to Esther, and uh, please uh, thank you for joining, Esther. It, we can't hear you, Esther. Sorry. Um, can you try again? Yes, sure. No, we can't. Audio tests can also fail, you know. So let's uh, give uh, Esther uh, a minute. Uh, no, neither. Let's give Esther uh, a second to reload her page. Um, as uh, as we wait for Esther, um, I and I forgot about this. Um, please remember. Uh, uh, I, I want to remind you all that all the questions will be gathered as responses in the forum. For those that are already in the forum, that is the majority of you. Uh, please jump into the forum and. Uh, send replies to the forum in order for uh, your questions to be considered for the speakers to uh, to speak. Of course, you can also join 
through audio. In that case, uh, I will take uh, care of your questions and send them to the forum myself. Um, Esther? Hello? There you go. Thank you, Esther. It's good to hear your voice now. Sorry, my headphones were not. Um, so, um, what I really wanted to do to start is go around um, for a quick round of introductions. Um, but do you think we have time to do like a, a one sentence intro for each person? Or should we just go into? Sure. Um, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so um, if if you would like to do so, um, I would like to go around and um, have each person say their name and a uh, one sentence description of anything they would like, really, um, how they would like to introduce themselves. So um, I'll go first. Uh, hi, my name is Esther um, and I am interested in this stuff as I have been working on uh, community cellular networks for a few years and I'm starting a Seattle community cellular network. Um, so that's my involvement in this. Um, and if I think we can all go down the list um, of users. So uh, Nico. Hi, uh, my name is Nico. Um, I work for the Association for Progressive Communications and I'm interested in this topic um, from a technical point and from a social point in how people organize uh, to sustain this infrastructure. Carlos? Hi everyone, my name is Carlos. I also work for the Association for Progressive Communications and uh, I'm I'm very interested on this because I think, um, although complex in, in in technical terms, I think uh, it's it would be easier if every community could run their own mobile broadband network, unlike uh, running the complex setups of uh, Wi-Fi networks. Thank you. Cynthia. Hi Esther, hi everybody. I'm Cynthia and I work also with APC as Gender and Women's Engagement Coordinator for Community Networks and happy to learn from you all. Dinesh? Hi, I'm Dinesh. I am locked down in India, but lucky to have this mesh network which we just connected. All the power was down, there's thunderstorms here. So I'm always interested in everything that's going on with the mesh and always learning something new every day. So I'm here. Uh, Deborah? Hi, I'm Deborah. Uh, I'm talking from Brazil. I also work for APC. Uh, I'm the comms associate for the, the local networks initiative. So my, I'm, I will be working with comps around this this year, and I'm really glad to be here. Thank you. Erica? Hello, everyone. Good morning, good evening. Um, I'm Erica from the Women's Rights Program in the Association for Progressive Communications. I know a bit about the, uh, oh, sorry, sounds like bad feedback, sorry. Was there a technical problem? Oh, um, I think I think there's no feedback. I think uh, okay, yeah. So Erica is replying in chat. Uh, hey, glad to be here. Okay, sure. Uh, thank you, uh, Eunice. Uh, Eunice? We can't hear you, Eunice. Maybe. Um, 
Okay, I guess Eunice is um, typing in the chat. Okay, um, Eunice says, sorry, Mike, not working. Glad to be here too and happy that communities are getting empowered. Um, how do you know? Hello, everyone. My name is Harira Waki. Um, I'm, I work for Center for Information Technology and Development, CETAT, here in Nigeria. Uh, John? So, uh, good evening from Kenya. And uh, um, we run a community network called Tunapanda, Tunapanda Net or TNet. And uh, I wanted to, uh, to reason because like learning is uh, a key component of who I am. And I want to know how different technologies can be integrated in um, a community network. Yeah, thank you so much. Carol? Uh, hello, I'm Karel. I'm based in Portugal and I'm uh, working at APC as Network Development Coordinator. Very glad to be here with all of you. Thanks. Kathleen? Hi, everyone. So nice to see all of you here. It's very exciting for me to, to really see the peers together. <laughs> so I was just saying, hi, I'm Kathleen. I'm based in Durban, South Africa. I'm part of uh, APC. Sorry, a bit of feedback. And um, yeah, working with the Local Networks Initiative. Thank you all so much for being here and hosting this. Uh, Lillian? Hi, I'm Lillian. <laughs> I'm Lillian and it's glad to see you all here. Luandro? <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, Luandro, uh, live in Brazil in a community network called Muinho. Uh, also work for with Digital Democracy. And yeah, just very interested in the all the topics that you know can bring communication and safe information for communities. <clears throat> Niels? Hi, this is Niels. Um, I'm based in Berlin. I'm part of Resonetica and also the joint project with APC Locknet. And uh, yes, I'm here because I'm interested in community networks and community uh, radio. Uh, so this intersection. Uh, yeah, great to hear you. Uh, Nirali. Yeah, hi all. This is uh, Nirali. Uh, I'm working with BIOF and uh, so I'm located at India and uh, I have just been working with community networks. I'm in uh, China offline. Then. Uh, I'm happy to hear and learn from all of you. Thank you. Uh, Penelope? Hello, everyone. My name is Penelope, and I am from Mexico. I'm living in Oaxaca, working for Telecomunicaciones Indígenas Comunitarias. Nice to hear, be here, with all of you. Peter? Hello, everybody. This is Peter Bloom, um, founder of Rhizomatica. It's really nice to be on a webinar with three women about community cellular networks, and uh, I'm looking forward to hearing what everyone has to say. Thanks. Sharbani? Hello, everyone. This is Sharbani, based out of India, Mumbai in India. And uh, it's so nice to see uh, women power in this uh, forum. And uh, I look forward to learning a lot uh, on, the, uh, on the mobile telephony in community networks. I work with APC as the Asia Regional Coordinator. Uh, so? 
Hi everyone, saying hi from Cape Town, South Africa. I work with Zenzeleni Community Networks in rural Eastern Cape. Uh, we work with Wi-Fi and I'm really keen to learn, be inspired by what you do because it would be interesting to see how we could transition one day or if. And it's just so, so good to hear everyone's voices. So thank you, Esther. It's really awesome. Steve? Hi everyone, Steve Song, uh, based in Nova Scotia, Canada. I work with both APC and Mozilla on policy and regulation to enable exactly this kind of network. Uh, Vasilis? Uh, hi everyone, uh, this is Vasilis calling from Greece, now on a, on a Greek island for the summer. Uh, working with uh, APC as well, but also with a community network in central Greece called the sarantaporo.gr community network. Really interested to hear what you have to say and um, relay this uh, information and hopefully inspiration back to my uh, community. Thank you. Awesome. I think that's everyone. And um... It's so nice to hear people's voices. Uh, I know it's a little ceremony, but it was really nice for everyone to actually meet each other. So thank you all for introducing yourselves. Um, I guess uh, to get started with kind of the uh, content of today's discussion, um, we wanted to broach the topic of you know, why are cellular or mobile telephony networks chosen as a solution in some spaces, as opposed to the many technology alternatives that exist? Um, and I would like to invite uh, both Lillian and Penelope to uh, answer this question, and I will also do so. So I guess either one can start. <laughs> Well, uh, I think we both can uh, start by uh, answering why do the communities choose to go with a mobile uh, telephony network. One of the main reasons is because there is uh, the coverage that we have with uh, one site. We can go through the whole community and with the uh, uh, terminals that they already have the mobile phones, it's, uh, it's easier for them to start communicating um, in the technical point of view. Uh, I don't know, Lini wants to add something. Yes, yes, well, uh, we choose cell phone network because we saw an opportunity to have uh, an available communicational service, not just in specific spaces but the spread in the territory, as Penelope said, because the coverage. People usually live in some populated centers from uh, where they go to their farms or work uh, far from their house. Then uh, it's important for them to, to maintain the communication with their families and friends and neighbors. And uh, a cell phone network brings this opportunity uh, also, because the cell phone network brings the possibility to share the infrastructure among many people uh, who will talk, I'll talk they, they do not have commercial coverage of these networks, uh, they are, are familiar with them and have a cell phone that they use in strategic points or, uh, or when they go outside the territory then people know the technology and, and it's easier for them to use uh, the cell phone network, even if it's a uh, very, I don't know, uh, simple uh, cell phone, um, and they can use the, the community network with, with these kind of devices. Uh, so just to clarify, uh, particularly what, what types of mobile telephony technologies have you deployed? Um, and also, what other um, community network technologies? So um, did you deploy you know, uh, 2G, GSM, LTE? Um, and also, did, have you deployed mesh networks or Wi-Fi mesh networks before? 
Well, uh, in TIC, Telecomunicaciones Indígenas, we have deployed basically 2G networks that uh, now they are 2.5G networks, which means you can have some amount of data transferring in very few speed uh, just for uh, uh, messaging, basically, Telegram, uh, WhatsApp. We are uh, now in the transition to a 4G mobile community network, and we haven't experienced the, the Wi-Fi mesh networks so far. Yes, in our case, we have been working with different communities, and each community has different solutions. Then, uh, for example, in, in Buenos Aires, Cauca, we um, implement a 2G network, uh, but also some Wi-Fi points in, uh, yes, in a, to, to, to link the, the different uh, radio bases that we put in the territory. But in other communities, uh, also in Cauca, in Colombia, uh, we have a Wi-Fi network. It's a, the, in this case, it's a network um, that many communi different communities use. Then some of them use a mesh network inside the community, but with the, a shared backhaul. I'm not sure if it's okay, a word, but a, but a shared backhaul within all the communities. Um, yes, then then we, we, we have different uh, solutions. Uh, also, in, in some time, we test uh, TV white space links. Uh, yeah. Awesome. Uh, thanks. And I will also um, talk about the that we're running in Seattle, a little different. I think um, it's very cool because we um, are using a new frequency. I'll we'll talk a little bit more about um, spectrum policies in, this, in a moment, but uh, we're using frequency that was recently just opened um, in the U.S. So mm -hmm. it's called Citizens Broadband Radio Service (CBRS). Um, and it's a dynamically licensed spectrum. So uh, we have to, like each of our equipment um, has to request access to um, every few minutes from a, um, a software service called a spectrum allocation service. And so um, we are, at, you know, at my university as part of my graduate work, uh, we're testing a model for uh, using it to uh, get spectrum for 4G networks and uh, those are the we're building um for you know those of you who are familiar um in works generally um compared to wi-fi the transmitters um are tend to be higher power and, uh, um, and you can like the basic you know mechanism a SIM card, you put it into your access device. And that's how your device authenticates to the network. Um, so there's the additional affordance, the additional ability to control with access. Interesting feature of LTE, of the LTE that we're using is the CBRS spectrum. Um, is currently only supported on certain phones, um, which are the newer, the newer higher end phones, such as the iPhone or the Pixel 4 and above. Um, so that's also a little bit of a hurdle, um, which is why it's it's more experimental. Um, so uh, it's possible to run LTE networks in many using many different types of spectrum, but um, it. Uh, you have to have the phones that support that frequency um, in order to use those networks. And so that's another um, challenge that we've been facing. 
and and how is it that you are facing it? Are you thinking about a plan to to get uh, cheap terminals for? Yeah. For I, um, so I guess you know cheap is a relative term. Um, we have fairly, uh, you know, we have reasonably affordable um, CPE that's called consumer premises equipment. They're fixed wireless um, receivers. They're like this big and you mount them on your house. Um, so as long as the, the quote unquote tower has line of sight to your house, then you can just receive the service in your home. Um, so that's uh, how we envision, you know, many rural areas would want to use this or might want to use this if they have like one transmitter, cellular transmitter in the center of town and are able to see the other houses. Um, but also for the mobile terminals, there's, um, you know, the secondhand market, which we've gotten pretty good results. So I would say um, the CPE receivers that we have are about uh, 150 USD. And the, the handsets uh, tend to be about 200 to 300 USD, even secondhand, because they're the newest phones. Um, and so we've been buying those with the grant funding that we've received, and they're specifically targeted at low-income neighborhoods, low-income users, uh, seniors, and other marginalized groups. So um, that's how we've been addressing that problem. Yeah, thanks so much for the question. Um, I guess I also wanted to uh, go a little bit into the origin story of the specific community networks that uh, we have started. So um, if I could ask uh, Lillian and Penelope to talk about, um, you know, the origin story, like why did that um, cellular network arise in the way that it did? Yes, I, I can start. Maybe. Um, well, uh, we, Buenos Aires is a rural community that is located in the southwest of Colombia, uh, where uh, indigenous people, Afro Colombian, and peasants share the, the territory. We started the project in 2017 when we visited the territorial re reincorporation area for FARC ex ex combatants that were allocated there in, in, in that municipality also in Buenos Aires. And there we meet with several surrounding communities uh, to brainstorm about their communication needs. And one of them uh, was the lack of cell phone infrastructure or deficiency of cell phone infrastructure. At the same time, we met with the experience of, of telecomunicaciones indígenas comunitarias of uh, the Penelope organization. <laughs> Uh, in Mexico and with Peter and, and people from Rizomatica and we get inspired uh, of this and after talk and know more um, about this experience with the communities we decide to explore this alternative for for, uh, for Buenos Aires. Uh, with the support of Rizomatica then we began to work with the communities on design and planning uh, their community cell phone network uh, also, since uh, 2017, we tried to find a way to use the spectrum because uh, it is a licensed spectrum. We first, exp first explore an experimental license, um, but the cost was very high at that time. Then we began to work in an agreement for a pilot, not only for testing the technology, but also to try different organizational and financial models. Then it was just until uh, 2019 when we could uh, sign the agreement Then take a lot of time, <laughs> almost two years. Uh, and we signed this agreement with the ICT ministry in Colombia to develop a pilot for a connectivity solution in Buenos Aires with the possibility to use a part of the spectrum frequency to test different technologies. Uh, then we start the project in that in that year. Yeah. <laughs> well, for for the case of telecomunicaciones indígenas, um, it all started with the need of the communities that they didn't have access to connectivity, 
Uh, we are in the southern part of Mexico, in Oaxaca state, which is a huge state uh, with a lot of communities in the mountains. And it is very difficult for everyone to go, even to visit the communities. Uh, there are no good uh, roads. And, well, for infrastructure, it's almost uh, unthinkable for the commercial uh, enterprises to go there and to serve the, the people. So uh, it, with a group of people like Peter and Eric Huerta, they start uh, looking at the possibility to have uh, a cheap uh, technology, uh, affordable technology, uh, um, and to make it like in the radio uh, community uh, broadcasting system, start uh, deploying the, the network without uh, the license from the government to, to radiate the, the signals in the legal frequencies. Uh, so it all uh, came together in one town, which is Talia de Castro. And they start there, the, the community network, after it began to, to work, then um, the process of getting the license with the government in Mexico also started and it was uh, kind of quickly to get this uh, spectrum license in 2016. And it was the first uh, concession for a social and indigenous operator for to operate in those areas where no one is going. So now we have, since that year, we have the, the option to be an operator in all these communities that they have no other options and that they are in the southern part of Mexico. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, I guess as a follow up question, um, what has been the most challenging thing about uh, the regulatory hurdles that you have had to deal with? Um, and, you know, how did you ultimately overcome them? Um, and uh, yeah, is there any advice in terms of, you know, um, how to work with regulations within one's country? Well, for, for the case of Mexico, uh, I think we have a very good legal team that was uh, in charge of this. Uh, in, uh, Eric Huerta uh, had the experience and knew the people from the IFETEL, the Instituto Federal de Telecomunicaciones. And it also uh, go smoothly because of the marketing that we were doing by that time. I mean, there are a lot of people in Mexico that lack of connectivity and it was not good for the Mexican government to be seen as a as a limiter for, for, for communities to have their own system. But um, even though we had the concession to transmit in the legal frequencies, uh, some time after that, uh, there was a, a request to pay for those frequencies. So just uh, recently this year, in the beginning of this year, we won that uh, demand and we are uh, avoiding these payments that were huge and that the uh, commercial operators pays normally for, for using the spectrum. So yeah, well, now we are uh, asking for more spectrum to be able to run 4G in another band frequency. And we are confident that we're going to get it because of this uh, background that we have and support from the general public. Um, here in Colombia, uh, I think it, it has been a learning process. As I said, we were working for more than a year with the ICT ministry, uh, telling them about the, the 
yes, telling them about the, the, the opportunity, the necessity, and trying to, to sign the agreement. Uh, finally, uh, when we, we, we obtain the agreement, then uh, almost for one year, that it was in 2019 and 20, 2020, <laughs> it's okay. Um, we were working in different documents, gathering information, uh, and telling them about the progress of the network. Uh, we were able to deliver a large amount of documentation <laughs> about the process uh, and about the social and technical situations that arose. Uh, in our case, we are not expert. Uh, we we don't have that kind of expertise in regulation, um, and although we have some people or a lot of people who advise us and motivate us, um, it was hard to work with with government. Uh, but um, yes, and and so I think sometimes government expect. Uh, um, information or things that we didn't understand what they want, <laughs> then it was so hard sometimes to work with government. But I think we we could explain them uh, the, the importance of the process. We also uh, participate in different open consultations about the spectrum, about um, Yes, about 5G even, about other technologies. Um, and with other organizations also in Colombia, we try to share information. Uh, there are other organizations with more expertise in legal issues, then also they they try to participate in different spaces. And yes, and is I think it's, it's important to have other organizations to support this kind of work. For example, when when the new uh, some changes in the ICT law were discussed in Colombia, uh, we were talking with a lot of organizations around the country, and it was so funny because uh, the government uh, had meetings in different uh, in different cities and in different parts of the of the country, and many people in different cities were and about the network and about the, the things that were happening because they knew about our process and I think it it, it works uh, because it even we we don't do not have uh, right now allow for community networks but some some different terms and concepts are now in the law that maybe uh, could help us to to have a better regulation for community networks uh, yeah that's really awesome. Um, so uh, I guess one follow up question is, um, why did it take so many years? Um, like, what was the thing that slowed slowed down the process? I know that working with government is generally slow, but uh, what what took kind of the longest time? Was it finding the right offices to talk to the right people or um, you know, getting public support, what would you say is, is slow? Uh, I think that the reasons that you said, um, know the right people, people who is interested, who is really interested in these kind of things. Um, yes, try to understand what, what they need because the government also needs some kind of arguments and things that maybe for us is different. Our arguments at, at, are different than what they need for convince uh, other people in the government or also commercial people, or people who is in, in, other, in other areas. Uh, then I think that's try to, to, to find that common language also. Uh, but also because this process takes time and need time. The process with the community needs time. You cannot, oh, for us, it has not been fast to, to try to understand the community and for the community to try to understand uh, the technology and also try to define a ra the right model for, 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 for the network. Then I think the process needs time 
and and a lot of times we need we want to have all very fast but it's not how it works <laughs> yes Yeah, well, I think for Mexico is that uh, uh, we could get the concession more or less quickly, but then we get also this uh, demand of payment that took longer to, to resolve. And this uh, period of time that was longer, I guess, is also because of the many cases that the Supreme Court has to deal with. So that was just the time that the, this uh, event uh, had the, the opportunity to be solved. And yeah. Yeah. Um, so I guess for in terms of my answer, um, it's a little bit simpler because in the US, we, um, the FCC was uh, sort of, you know, that the regulatory change came first which allowed CBRS spectrum to be used um, on a national level. So it was really, um, we are also like taking a long time to negotiate with the city and the county governments um, because our, um, so our networks are going up on the rooftops of buildings in order to um, be easier than, you know, building a tower and all of those expenses. Um, we. We want to promote community engagement by partnering with local nonprofits um, and other organizations like churches and mosques and, you know, other community centers. So um, we uh, we have been also working with the city. So um, I fortunately was able to get a contact at the city of Seattle um, IT where uh, you know, I have a person who is now working with me to figure out if there are any regula regulations that um, I need to follow. So she was able to tell me about, um, you know, all the permit processes for putting antennas on different buildings. Um, and so she is the one who, um, like, we, we have a meeting every week and she's been helping me along this process. And we even got, um, some we got agreements from some public schools like Seattle City of Seattle public schools to mount the uh, LTE sites on their rooftops, which are some of the tallest buildings in the city. Um, but the problem is that we uh, have to work like on a city by city basis because uh, each city has their own permit processes. Um, so we have worked with the city of Seattle, but now we're trying to go more south. Um, south of Seattle, we have some smaller cities that are lower income and, you know, um, they have less, less internet infrastructure. So um, with each city, it's kind of a new struggle. Um, we haven't been able to get a nationwide policy change, you know, allowing, uh, facilitating community networks. It's more of a very local problem. Yeah. Yes, um, I, I'm agree, sir. And the, for example, in our case, uh, I think it was difficult to say that the same model is uh, for all the communities and for all the municipalities and for all the rural uh, space in Colombia. We have very different regions, very different communities, and maybe sometimes the government tried to find a, a unique model, a, yes, and for us, it was not so easy to try to explain that it don't, it is not possible to have just one model. That you need be more flexible and have some some simple uh, rules, maybe that and and the communities uh, yes can can explore their own models and their own yes opportunities in in their territories. Oh, one thing that um, I would like to just briefly introduce um, is, Lily, could you um, explain what is a regulatory sandbox and uh, what what is that uh, in relation to your network? Yes, um, well, since last year, I think, um, Colombia and the 
the uh, let me see the the name okay one organization in Colombia <laughs> that is from the government um, who regulate all these things of about 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 uh, yes networking and things like that um, is trying to create this space of sandbox regular regulatory sandbox uh, then uh, the idea I'm not an expert but the idea is that you can um, put in operation different strategies and technologies and models uh, don't matter if they are not adapted to the actual uh, regulatory framework and if it's a um, very innovative thing that you are doing and they guess you can operate and bring some information and in in this space of operation uh, try to look together uh, the right regulation that you need for continue continue with these kind of services then now the, the this this process is open we are trying to present uh, the community networks for the sandbox for, for the sandbox and yes and, and try to to find a, a way to to produce a regulatory framework for community networks with the sandbox Awesome. Um, so, Nico, are we able to go a little past the hour or, um, yeah, we have some material still to cover. Yes, uh, uh, that's another thing that I didn't say. Uh, we were thinking of doing 90 minutes, so uh, feel free to, to continue. Um, and uh, if you have more time, then we can get more out of you. Like, <laughs> we can learn more from you. But uh, 90 minutes will be the Great. Thanks so much. And there are some questions already in the forum uh, and the ones that are in the chat that are not in the forum, I am moving them there. So um, so just for you to wait them uh, as you move on with the with the structure of the forum, the, of the webinar. Um, OK, I think uh, the questions I see in the chat are um, what has been your role in setting up the mobile telephony in your community network and how has sustainability of the network been ensured? Okay. Um, well, uh, my role in Telecomunicaciones Indígenas is uh, I'm participating as the coordinator for the operations. So I'm setting the logistics for visiting the communities uh, with the whole team, the operational team, which uh, the organization of the cooperative Telecomunicaciones Indígenas is basically the community itself owns the network. And we support through all the process of uh, getting the, the equipment, uh, building the capacity to operate and manage the equipment, the users, the whole system, and this uh, continuous support for the, the technical, social, legal issues that arise when you operate uh, a network. Every community became a, 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 an operator in, in association with Telecomunicaciones Indígenas, and uh, sustain, sustainability uh, comes when the number of users are big enough that uh, every user every user pays uh, a fee a monthly fee that is divided in basically three three areas uh, one the biggest proportion basically half of this fee remains in the community to to support the expenses of running the system like energy, uh, the internet uh, service that we need for the outgoing and incoming uh, calls from the outside of the community. And sometimes it also goes to the person that uh, helps with the administration of the system and the customer support. Oh. Another part of the fee goes to this operational team, which I lead. And that helped us um, make all this uh, support possible. 
and and a small part of this fee goes to a, a common fund, which is like an insurance fund in case of uh, an emergency in a community that the equipment fails. We can get uh, a little bit of this uh, money for repairing and taking back to service the network. So we are not yet uh, completely uh, sustainable because the, the the quantity of users we have is not yet the the reaching point of uh, being uh, sustainable. But we're going to we're working to that. A quick follow up. Um, how is the uh, so you said that the each each community is an operator. Um, how is that operator status different from a commercial telecom, or is it the same? Yeah, the the concession uh, status is a social and indigenous operator. So that's the the name for every community that has their own mobile system. They become a social indigenous operator. Um, yeah, I, I specifically what uh, what are the legal requirements for that? Or yeah. Um, What's special about that status? Well, the thing is that uh, we can only be operating in areas that there are no commercial options. And uh, we have to comply with the uh, uh, paperwork, like uh, uh, being consistently operating. I mean, once we start, we have to be careful to continue the operation. and. Uh, to report every every month on every or every uh, semester how many networks we have as a, as a so association as a telecomunicaciones because every community became part of a, of the telecomunicaciones indígenas comunitarias so basically just uh, keep reporting what we are doing to the government and how many frequencies, how many channels we're using of those uh, being assigned to TIC. Um, so I guess, does that status remain when other telecom operators come in, like commercial operators? Yes, we are still working, uh, but we are, we're seeing that in some communities, uh, commercial operators are now a possibility. So we are now facing this challenge, how to cope with this uh, new signal that is arriving to the to the communities. Um, we, we have this uh, other uh, base of, of the organization, which is the social uh, structure and the social dynamics of the community. And in cases where where the telephony is seen as a as a sorry as a uh, community uh, own thing, uh, they know that this is a, if they go with the commercial option, they will lose some of the benefits of of having and taking advantage of having their own telephone system. Um, basically, we are going through this as a, how to say, conscientization, like, of the people, that uh, what is best for them, just to go with the commercial ones and maybe have other options of services, of, of being able to choose whenever they want to go with uh, commercial and then go back to the community network in order to be uh, more uh, able to control their own expenses and also the, the benefits, basically, of, of giving these uh, expenses to the community and not to the external. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks so much. Uh, so, do you have a uh, uh, answer to the question? Oh. 
network. Uh, the question originally was, what has been your role in setting up the, te the mobile telephony in your community network? And how has sustainability of the network been ensured? And uh, thank you, sir. Um, well, um, when we began uh, with the dream <laughs> in Colombia, uh, yes, we were working with 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 Julian and yes, trying to understand first the technology and how to to explore this opportunity in Colombia and talking with the communities and yes and trying to understand also the necessities in the communities um also with the rhizomatica team uh, working on the on some technical things uh, at least know the basic things about the technology then there's a lot of things that that, that yes when 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 the project begins a lot of things, uh, but then uh, more people came to work with us, in, uh, and then I was leading the team, uh, also talking with the government uh, about about the project and trying to to explain them what we were doing. Um, yes, I think the role changes depending on the necessities. <laughs> Um, also training and yes, and learning with the people. You you learn a lot with work with when when work with communities. Learning many things that community teach us when we was working. We were working with them. Um, yes, I think it's a our our role that that changed depending on the necessities. Um, and about the sustainability. Uh, we we were working with the community trying to define a financial model for the network. It was so hard uh, when 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 we began uh, because people not all the people uh, were convinced. The leaders, yes, the leaders were working and convinced about the project, but some other people in the community not then uh, it it takes a period to have the network working and then the people could use that and and and, and believe in what we were doing uh, then they were um they had i don't know how to say in english they they estaban dispuestos a pagar <laughs> or uh, to give a uh, or uh to pay or not? Yes, yes. The, yes. The, the, then they, they we said, yes, we are going to pay something. Yeah. They were willing to pay. Ah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. Uh, and, and it works, but then we have some problems with the energy in some of the radio bases. Then the network didn't work very well. Then people again, uh, yes go go back in some in some parts of the region then it i think it's a process uh, where you have to combine organizative and technical issues and a lot of things uh, many of the work that were uh, that were i don't know how to say that that we did or uh, that the people uh, did there uh, was in a voluntary basis because yeah, yes they they didn't receive any any payment for that uh, then like e the operation is not so expensive because many people in the community bring things bring time work energy uh, food no? then many people collaborate to, to have the network working, then it's not so expensive, but uh, but but yes, we are working also in 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 the in a better model to sustain the network. Awesome, uh, thanks. I uh, on my part, 
Uh, I guess so. First, I'll answer the question about roles. Um, like Lillian, I think I've been just taking on any kind of roles that is needed. Um, the so the first thing uh, was to form a nonprofit because normally I'm a graduate student. I work in a research laboratory. Um, so in order to start working with the city um, and applying for a kind of public grants. Um, we formed a nonprofit and we also um, we got initial funding for three network sites um, from a grant that was a federal grant uh, for COVID relief. So that was just last year and that funding got parceled out to um, the county. So um, on the county level, we got the grant and uh, we were going to focus on particularly low income communities and specifically marginalized groups. So, um, you know, majority non English speaking or unemployed or seniors or people struggling with homelessness. Um, so those are the main targets for, you know, the regions that we pick and also the people who we give devices to. Um, and so my role was, um, you know, from that nonprofit, we applied for those grants and we were continuing to apply for kind of these initial startup grants to uh, buy more equipment. So once we have the equipment in hand and because um, our lab has the capacity to program all the equipment and set it up, um, we can say uh, we, we reach out to partner organizations. So other nonprofits in the area and say, hey, we have this equipment um, and we have the capacity to deploy the technology. Can you partner with us to work with the communities? And so um, we have two major grassroots organizing partners now. Uh, one of them is API Chaya, um, Asia Pacific Island, Islander Chaya. Um, uh, the group is specifically for um, reducing violence in, um, in the local area. So mostly like domestic violence and violence against women, but they also have been working on um, improving internet connectivity as a resource for uh, survivors of violence. And then there's uh, a project called the Black Brilliance Research Project, which is a um, mostly black community organization. It's a coalition of many different black organizations across the, um, the county. And so they organize with um, a lot of black and people of color communities. Um, and they, uh, they also have a lot of connections in the city um, and a lot of funding. So partnering with them, we ran training for um, a lot of different community members. Uh, it was all virtual because it's during COVID. So um, they helped with the recruitment of all of the trainees. Um, and so I was also in the role of uh, teaching the training because um, of our technical expertise in the lab. Um, and now uh, we are currently, you know, trying to find legal support to discuss some of these uh, questions like, you know, what do we, what status do we have to set up for the communities, like individual, you know, nonprofits or, you know, groups of users and, and partner organizations um, that will own the networks and how will our nonprofit relate to those uh, networks and how do we, um, you know, make that MOU or contract um, and, uh, as Penelope said, I think we have to come up with a, um, a structure for how fees will be used and things like that. So we're currently discussing that um, in our community meetings with all, we, we also have a lot of volunteers. So um, with all of our volunteers and all of our um, interested potential users, because right now we don't have deployed networks yet. We're like two weeks away maybe from our first deployment. Um, so we're still discussing those questions. Yeah. Um, I got a few questions uh, in the chat about specifically the CBRS stuff. Um, so did I have any issues with antenna radiation considerations from inhabitants from Vesalis? And uh, I think the, the short answer is yes. Uh, a lot of people are freaked out about 5G and COVID. <laughs> Um, so, 
unfortunately, uh, this is true in a lot of, you know, just, just areas throughout the city. There's a lot of misinformation everywhere. Um, so as soon as people hear like, oh, you know, cellular, like antenna, they think it's going to be 5G and it's, you know, on a building. So it's closer to them than the tower. But um, in our brochure, we have a section on safety and we say, hey, um, this is a very low power device compared to traditional cellular telephony. And we try to, you know, provide this training and this um, outreach, but uh, often, you know, we have to provide that in advance. Like uh, we're designing an FAQ document um, to send to people if they uh, have these kinds of questions and it requires a lot of outreach, yeah. Um, and there's also another question about, uh, does general access to CBRS spectrum in Seattle provide you enough spectrum to offer broadband services? This is actually um, an interesting question because currently, yes, currently the CBRS spectrum is not used. So if you look at the map of, um, like in our spectrum allocation service tool, which uh, we get from Google, normally you have to purchase that service for um, you know some amount of money per month per base station, but um, we were able to get a free experimental agreement. Um, so if you look at the map of uh, spectrum availability, like it's all green, there's no one else there. Um, so right now it's okay for us, but in the future, if uh, because the telecom company companies have bought priority access licenses, which are higher priority than ours, which are general access. So um, in general, uh, the telecoms will be able to take away that spectrum if they come in. And uh, we're expecting maybe this will take uh, five years if they decide to adopt it. Um, so we have kind of a limited timeline to get started with these community networks, but once they are established, if we argue that, hey, they're providing, you know, important service, then maybe we can argue for some kind of policy change to um, help our networks survive. Um, but it's a lot of the value of, of community networks is the community organizing stuff. So um, once we get together, like the people power to make this argument and to start providing services to themselves and who have training, then um, hopefully that will be a better, um, like a better base or foundation to switch to another technology if we need to, or to, um, you know, ask the government for some considerations. Yeah. Um, so I guess I wanted to uh, switch to a slightly different topic. Um, how have the affordances of cellular networks affected community engagement and interactions? Um, and even, you know, the community structures or community organizing and outreach that you need to do? Could you repeat the question is there, please? Yes, yes. Um, okay, so how have uh, the affordances, basically what you can do or the, the technology of uh, cellular networks affected community engagement and interactions, um, such as organizing and uh, basically how people engage with the network? Um. As, as mentioned before, we have run basically telephony networks so far. So communication has been a real possibility for many people and for the people from the community to be able to contact their, their uh, relatives in, in another cities and to be able to, to call the people that is visiting the community that is going to sell something in the community for a moment, it, it's been a, a, a quite a benefit for them. Uh, we are thinking that maybe with the 4G community network, another dynamic will be uh, experienced. And we would like to address that uh, with the community, uh, with the 
constant uh, time to reflect about what they want, what they need, and how to be careful with this uh, very wide window of, of uh, the internet that represents in the community. So one of the options for 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 that to contrarest, counterattack that uh, new exposure is to promote the uh, building of their own uh, content, uh, of their own uh, systems to or information to share between the among the people from the village. But uh, as far as it is now, text messaging and and voice, basically, we've seen that it's been a, a very good uh, option for them. Yeah, I guess to follow up on that a little bit, um, I think you had mentioned that, you know, um, I believe you in in previous discussions uh you said that there was some um it, well given the new access to kind of the broader internet people are um able to do a lot more things on the internet so there's a lot of usage compared to like the data that you use in 2.5 g yeah sure a lot more and the usage is uh, basically what we do in the in the series like going through youtube going through uh, facebook and so on so having a very limited resource in the communities we need to be more aware of what we are doing with the internet yeah and i think um the kind of the source of that limited resource um, is that the backhaul is kind of constrained. So the the total amount of internet bandwidth coming into the town is probably not that great. Um, how much would you say that that is, like the bandwidth? Well, for our 2G networks, we just need uh, two megabits per second, uh, symmetrically, uplink and downlink. And we're foreseeing uh, 45 megabits per second for the 4G. But considering this alternative to have a local server for local content, so built by the community, this content, that then doesn't need to go to the outside and go back using this backhaul. Uh, yeah, but I guess what's the importance of the local content and have you been, um, you know, building that local content already or is this kind of a future plan? Well, it's kind of a, a, a dream that arises some years ago. So we, we, we together with a lot of uh, another organizations in, in Latin America, we're thinking about how this could work and how to build a platform, how to get a commitment from the community, how uh, to build the capacities in the community. So it's an ongoing process, not yet defined uh, at all, basically. I don't know, Lily has also been part of this uh, reflection process about the intranets and so on, what many, many organizations are working on it. Uh, Lily, could you speak to that a little bit? Yes, uh, as Penelope said, it's, not, um, it's a, a topic that we, with many organizations, uh, are working since, since some time. <laughs> Uh, and I think many communities are already producing their own contents, not not only for intranets, but also for radio, also for for other media, even for social networks. And they have a lot of materials that uh, maybe could be organized in a a, a server uh, in a in a self server in the networks. Then. 
In the other side, yes, we are working also in capacity, in building capacity in the communities and trying to find the best way to, to produce these contents and maybe, for example, I'm, I'm right now in Mexico and trying the, that the models also um, bring uh, a resource to create contents, no? then, then have some funds, some some money to to promote the the creation of contents uh, for the communities and the, i think there is a lot of strategies and and yes it's, it's a very important point for for uh, for for networks that include include uh, internet and that yeah um thank you for that um indigenous communities i think that's really exciting um are there any particular technologies you're using um, or, you know, uh, other kinds of, you know, tools you're using to create or to plan to create this, um, this local content? Mm, we are exploring uh, with, with some people that is here also in, in uh, and with the, the, the other peers, no, we, we have been exchanging information about different kind of technologies and yes but i think the basis is, is is the content not the video the media the the podcast how how you can produce that then if you have content then there is a lot of technological solutions uh, yes but, but the most important thing is the content and yes that, that the people in the communities uh, start to produce and in their own languages also no? yeah. yeah i know um i with nico i was able to visit at least one um uh village in oaxaca that uh was running also a community radio station like that was part of their organizing structure for the community cellular network as well so um through that i think they were already producing a lot of local content and it was just a matter of setting up the server um, which was really cool yeah um so uh, to clarify i guess in case people haven't um heard of this uh word before intranet is different from internet in the sense that intranet is uh, within the community. So if, um, you know, if the wider internet, like the backhaul, the connection to the, um, the source of wider internet access is, is down, then um, they will still have access to the local server and all the local content. So that's why we call it the intranet because it's inside. Yeah, and it can also be blocked from access from the outside in case you want to reserve the content for the internal community. Um, so uh, I guess just to, um, I'll wrap up uh, in our remaining time talking about the situation in the Seattle network. Um, one of the greatest disadvantages, in my opinion, um, to the cellular technology is that it is harder to use. Um, in at least in our case, um, in our technical ecosystem, it's possible to just buy off the shelf um, like mesh networking devices and plug them in. And the configuration is quite easy um, because these are you know designed by um, like commercial designers to be to have a nice uh, user interface and everything. So, um, you know, you can just buy Ubiquiti devices and set up a, a Wi-Fi mesh network really easily. But for cellular, we're using the open source ecosystem. Um, it's not as easy to understand, not as easy to deploy. Um, so that's one of the main challenges that we've been facing in terms of community engagement. Like people know less about how cellular technologies work in the first place because everyone has, you know, in the US, they have their home Wi Fi routers, so they at least understand Wi Fi a little bit. But um, in terms of cellular, you know, there's all this misinformation about 5G and the frequencies, and, you know, they just like feel a little bit more trepidation and like fear. So um, the training process has been quite hard. Um, there are some 
functions. Like if we want to train installers, then they might need to use the command line or like use Linux for the first time. Um, and this is quite advanced stuff that normally you see in your first few years of computer science um, in a university. So um, in order to train community members, I think it's a bigger learning curve, but it's also really great when people achieve that um, because it means that like they really have gotten a lot of advanced knowledge that's then valuable for their, you know, the rest of their life. Um, and so we're hoping to keep training people, even if they move on after, you know, maybe one or two years of uh, working or volunteering and installing uh, the networks, I think um, it will still be a valuable contribution to the community. Yeah. As long as we can still get funding for for more education and more training. <laughs> Um, so I guess we have reached time um, and I wanted to open it up to more questions um, if if people are able to stick around. But otherwise, I think, um, you know, if you have to leave, please feel free. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you, Esther, for conducting this. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lily. It was Thank a pleasure you, to be here. It was a pleasure to share with you. <laughs> so. uh, I'm so in the presence of uh, people who have deployed, you know, such great real world networks and have done such great work. Um, let's see. So we had one question, um, which I saved for the end about um, whether we will be challenged by changing policies. So changing politics, policies that would deprive us of spaces that we've managed to open for cellular networks. Um, so, are yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I think we have in, in Mexico a particular uh, context that the, uh, another commercial uh, operator that is called the share network, Red Compartida, that it was supposed to be an enabler of uh, deploying uh, connectivity to more people. So this, this network is, be, is reaching out uh, the communities, some of the communities, and the thing with the network is that they cannot sell directly their services to the, to the end users. So they have to go through mobile virtual operators, MNOs. And, and as they are reaching the communities that we're working on, uh, we are now uh, thinking about becoming an MNO with this uh, network so we can. Um, reply or, or uh, get the same scheme of uh, getting some benefits for the community or the people from the community, not just being uh, seen as, as users or, or consumers of services. So together with uh, Redes, the, another organization, and TOSEPA, and the cooperative that Lil is working on, uh, we're going to to promote this uh, new scheme of community network with the infrastructure of a big uh, enterprise, but with the advantage of the uh, social organization. Wow, that's super interesting. <laughs> um, are there any like hurdles or challenges you see to this kind of integration? Many, many challenges. <laughs> I don't know if Lily wants to talk about it. Well, uh, Tosepan, uh, which is, uh, the, I think, the largest cooperative in Mexico and uh, strongest, uh, 
has been working with uh, this uh, process of becoming an MBNO because they already have the signal in their area, in their territory, uh, being uh, deployed in Quetzalan. So the challenge is to how to become uh, an MBNO, and it requires a lot of things, not, not only money, integration costs to the network, but also to have a very clear uh, social organization within the community and also technology uh, uh, development like a CRM or well lots of things to put together again technical social legal things sorry what is CRM oh there is a cat Customer relationship management, like the software to manage the 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 users and the people and the information. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, and uh, Lily, do you have anything on the the changing policies question? Mm, yes, I think. It, all the time we need to to be exploring the way to introduce this 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 kind of of of, of alternatives no because the usually the 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 regulation is not created for these kind of things this kind of, of innovation social innovations then i think all the time we we have to be exploring and looking what they are proposing and and yes, it's a challenge also to try to participate in the open discussions and not just participate, but uh, try to to que sean tenidos en cuenta, like your participations, yes, being here. Yes, because sometimes you participate, but they don't matter <laughs> do what they want to do. Then yes, I think there is a lot of challenge. And for us, it's also to to know more about how how the regulation and the politics works. That for some of us is not so easy. Uh, then I think yes. <laughs> yeah, I definitely empathize with not being used to working with policy and like legal things. You know, I uh, started as just a technical student, so uh, it's been really an adjustment. Are there any um, offline questions that we should take? Maybe, uh, Nico, should we stop the recording? <laughs>